Hi everyone, this is the last mini lecture of chapter 12. In this mini lecture, I will be talking about antimicrobial proteins, which are the last part of our second line of defense. So the first antimicrobial protein I'd like to talk about is interferon. This is a small protein and it's produced naturally in our bodies by certain white blood cells and by some tissue cells. There are three main types of interferon that we will talk about. The first two are interferon alpha and beta. These are produced by lymphocytes, fibroblasts, and macrophages. We also have interferon gamma, which is produced by T cells. We'll be talking more about T cells in chapter 13. Although interferon was originally thought to be directed against just viruses, we are now finding that it is involved in the defense against microbes and also plays a role in immune regulation and intercommunication. So what are the activities of interferon? The interferon can bind to cell surfaces and induce changes in genetic expression. And this can vary depending on the cell surface that they attach to. All three of the interferons can inhibit the expression of cancer genes. And they also have tumor suppress suppressor effects. So these are really important in fighting cancer. And then interferon alpha and beta can stimulate phagocytes, so can stimulate, stimulate phagocytosis within a host. And interferon gamma is the immune regulator of macrophages and T and B cells. So with gamma, it tends to play a role in specific immunity, which we'll talk about in chapter 13. So how does this work? This, is, this section is going into what it does with viruses. It can bind viruses and other microbes to receptors on the host cells and then signal the cell to produce interferon. This interferon then will rapidly be secreted into extracellular space and it will bind to other neighboring host cells. And the binding of that interferon to the host cells will induce that cell to produce proteins that inhibit viral multiplication. So it's almost like vaccinating these other host cells so that they cannot either produce viruses if they become infected or they can block infection by viruses. So it can degrade viral RNA. It can also prevent translation of viral proteins within a host cell. It's not microbe specific, so it's not for a particular virus or microbe. It is a non-specific way of fighting this. And it's a valuable treatment for a number of virus infections. So what does this look like? From your book, this is the antiviral activity of interferon. We start on the left-hand side with an infected cell. So this is the virus infection coming in, releasing that nucleic acid, and starting to assemble new viruses. But this particular cell has the interferon gene, which is then stimulated from infection. It makes interferon, and it will send that out into the extracellular space. This then will attach to a special receptor on a neighboring cell, which will activate genes within this uninfected or perhaps just now newly infected cell that will degrade the virus nucleic acids and or block virus replication. So it has this great way of communicating with neighboring cells through the use of interferon. So that's the main role of interferon. Some other antimicrobial proteins, we have something called complement antimicrobial proteins. These are named for the property of that they complement the immune reaction. And it's a very complicated uh, cascade reaction, but we'll kind of go into it in a very broad way. So it consists of 26 blood proteins that will all work together to destroy bacteria and some viruses. 
and it's a cascade reaction. And when I say a cascade reaction, it means that there is sequential physiological response. So as one substance in a chemical series is produced, it will then activate a next substance, which activates the substance after that. So it's this cascade of substances that follow that will actually do the function. So the stages in the complement cascade would start out with initiation, and this is a C1 component, which will bind to an initiator bound to a foreign cell. So this is the very start. It recognizes a foreign cell, and it binds to that initiator. That C1 binding then leads to C5 being cleaved and bound to the membrane, so the adding of another complement protein. And then what we get is polymerization. The C5 product, so once it binds, becomes the site for the assembly of this membrane attack complex. And this membrane attack complex is C5 through C9, which form a complex that can actually put a hole or a pore into the cell membrane of the foreign cell and leads to lysis of that foreign cell. So this is a great diagram, once again, from your book. It's showing that this is a bacteria, and on that cell surface, we have these antimicrobial-bound uh, cells. The C1 will come in and bind to these initiator sites. And then what we get is this cascade of different components being added in until we have a complex, this polymerization in the complex, which can actually then put a hole in that bacterial cell and cause it to lyse. And this is the classical complement pathway. Um, there are other pathways, but in general, I want you to recognize that it's a number of different uh, components that make this complex and actually can function as an antimicrobial agent. So that is the complement antimicrobial agents. We also have antimicrobial proteins that are iron binding proteins. Both humans and bacteria require iron for enzymes. And you might remember that there's often a metal cofactor that's needed for a functioning enzyme. And so if we can bind iron, it can become a rate limiting factor in bacterial growth. Bacteria can't grow if they can't bind iron to get their enzymes to function. So that iron binding protein that we produce keep that iron unavailable to bacteria. So it will slow down the growth of bacteria. These are some examples of iron binding proteins that you might find in the human body. We have hemoglobin, which is found in red blood cells, transferrin, which is found in blood and tissue fluids. We have lactoferrin, which is found in milk and saliva. And we have ferritin, which is found in every cell type. And then you should keep in mind though that some bacteria actually have ways around this. It's kind of a battle that we have between host and uh, infecting agent. They have something called siderophores, which are proteins produced by the bacteria that are capable of scavenging iron from these iron binding proteins. So this is their kind of response to our iron binding proteins. And these are actually able to bind iron more tightly than human proteins. So this is a way that a bacteria could get around our defense of iron binding proteins. So on to the last of the antimicrobial proteins. We have antimicrobial peptides, and these are just short proteins of between 15 to 20 amino acids, and they have the ability to insert themselves into the membrane of prokaryotic membranes or microbes. The names for some of these are defensin, magonins, and protegrins. And researchers are actually studying theirs, studying these. Um, and looking for ways to turn these antimicrobial peptides into therapeutic drugs. Because these have this great ability, and you'll see it in our last slide, of inserting themselves into the cell membrane and causing then that bacteria, the bacterial cell membrane, to break up and then what you end up getting is lysis of that cell. 
and this is a, a really effective way to kill a bacteria. So that's the last of our nonspecific immunities. Next chapter we'll be looking at specific immunity.